So how are we going to recognize that someone might be developing type 1 diabetes mellitus? Well, there is a, a classic triad of presentation. And that classic triad is polyuria, excessive volumes of urine, thirst, and weight loss. This is the classic triad that should alert us to the possibility that diabetes mellitus uh, is, uh, is presenting itself. And we've said that the uh, antibodies are going to take quite a long time to destroy the beta cell mass. And when 70 to 90% are destroyed, clinical features are going to occur. And even though it can take a long time for the immune system to destroy the beta cell mass, the presentation can be relatively acute. So the, the patient might present with just a few days symptoms. The sooner the better, obviously, but it can be a relatively acute presentation. And there is a polyurea. Now, what's going on here? Why does the patient have a polyurea? Well, the patient is not producing any insulin. Therefore, blood sugar levels are going to rise. There's going to be a hyperglycemia. Now, if there's a hyperglycemia, that means that there'll be large amounts of glucose in the blood, and glucose is readily filtered from the gemellulus into Bowman's capsule in the renal tubules. So as the blood sugar levels rise, the amount of sugar in the renal tubules in the nephrons is also going to rise. And some of this will be reabsorbed. The renal tubules have the ability to reabsorb about 11 millimoles of glucose as that glucose passes through the renal tubule. Any more than that, and they won't be able to reabsorb it all. That means in the distal part of the convoluted tubule, there will still be a lot of glucose molecules. And glucose, of course, is a very osmotic molecule. Glucose will suck water to itself. Remember, osmosis is the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane under the influence of osmotic pressure. So the glucose within the lumen of the nephron will generate an osmotic pressure. That will attract water unto itself. It will suck water into the lumen of the nephron. If you like, the water is trying to dilute the glucose. So what this means is, yes, there'll be a glucose urea, but you won't know that by looking at the urine. You'd have to test it or taste it to, to decide that. But the glucose is osmotic, so it's sucking lots of water with it. So as the kidney is excreting glucose, it's going to excrete lots and lots of osmotically attracted water with it. And this is called an osmotic diuresis. There is a diuresis, which is an abnormally large amount of urine being produced. And that diuresis occurs for osmotic reasons, because of all this glucose that can't be reabsorbed. So there's a polyurea, and that polyurea is, is a glucose urea. And as large amounts of water are being eliminated from the body, it could be huge amounts, I mean, you know, m many, many litres per day. Then, obviously, that's going to reduce the amount of water left in the body, and the patient is going to become dehydrated. And, of course, as the patient becomes dehydrated, that's going to make them thirsty. Simple as that. So they're going to be very thirsty and drink lots and lots of water. But even though the patient's drinking lots of water, very often the water drinking can't cope. And these patients can develop hypovolemia and uh, eventually low blood pressure because of that, because they're excreting so much water. But they will be very thirsty and they'll drink and drink and drink to try and replace the water which is being lost by the osmotic diuresis. So... First two parts of the classic triad, polyurea and thirst. The third part is weight loss. Now, remember that the mitochondria like to use glucose to produce the energy. And of course, the mitochondria are inside the cell and the glucose is outside the cell. And because there is no insulin in type 1 diabetes, the insulin receptors aren't triggered. There's nothing wrong with the insulin receptors. They, 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 they work perfectly. It's just that there's no insulin to stimulate them. That means that the glucose transporter molecules are not able to transport the glucose into the cells. And this is the great irony in diabetes. 
there in type 1 diabetes there is huge amounts of glucose in the blood and tissue fluids really really high levels um, but none in the cells so there's masses of glucose it's just all in the wrong places it should be inside the cells where it's being used but it, it can't get in there because the insulin is not there to open the glucose gates so what this means is that the mitochondria are obliged to produce energy from other sources and the other sources they use to produce energy are fats and energy will also be produced from from proteins so the mitochondria are burning fats and proteins instead of the glucose they would like to burn and of course as they burn fats and proteins that means that fat and protein are going to be lost from the body and there's going to be a weight loss so the weight loss well acute weight loss is partly dehydration but the, 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 the ongoing weight loss is that the body is burning its own proteins it's burning its fat reserves to produce energy instead of glucose so it's not really surprising there's going to be um, weight loss and also in this circumstance where the body is burning fats rather than carbohydrates ketones will be produced now we're going to talk about ketones in more detail later on but let's notice for now that ketones are organic products which are made when fats are burnt in the absence of carbohydrates so if there's a ketosis again that's that's a good indicator that there is an insulin lack because it means that fats are being burnt in the absence of carbohydrates and that can be detected in the urine or, or in the blood so if there's a polyurea especially if there's a glucose urea if the patient is thirsty or the patient is losing weight so simple such a simple test test the patient's blood sugar levels and see what it is and very often a diagnosis is unfortunately only too obvious from that um, now glucose tolerance tests can be performed uh, that will see how the body responds to a glucose challenge in type 1 diabetes that may not even be necessary and then for an absolute diagnosis if you actually do do a biopsy of the pancreas you see these inflammatory changes and destruction of the beta cells so again any form of clinical person you want to be if you don't know that the classic presentation of diabetes mellitus is polyuria thirst and weight loss then you're not going to be very safe uh, there's other presenting features lack of energy because the sugar is not getting into the muscles there can be blurred vision because glucose can absorb into the uh, humors of the eye and, and alter the internal refractive indices of, of the eye itching is quite common salt and water depletion as we said can lead to tachycardia to hypertension over time weight progressive weight loss muscle wasting now the glucose urea the presence of sugar in the urine can also lead to cystitis uh, vulvitis ba balanitis in men inflammation of, of, of the glands penis because because there's so much sugar in the urine and it's just making these infections that bit more likely uh, that that bit easier to present because there's lots and lots of glucose around and as well as that the white blood cells don't move very well through sugary movement so the body's a uh, defense systems are going to be are going to be impaired as well right so what the heck do we do about it well as we've said it's an insulin dependent diabetes mellitus so these patients need admitted to a medical ward and they need to be stabilized and stabilization isn't that straightforward really because as well as having abnormal amounts of sugar remember we said that the potassium goes through the, the the same gate so these patients can be can be hyperkalemic as well the potassium can be high and, and and that's dangerous because very high or low levels of potassium can cause ventricular fibrillation and what we don't want to do to potassium is bring it crash bring it crashing back down to normal levels very quickly it needs to be a, a progressive process so these patients need to be managed and we need to think about their glucose their hydration their ketosis their electrolyte balance we need to think about the whole patient and bring them back down to normal levels of glucose progressively but in, in a controlled environment but of course insulin is always going to be integral to the to the treatment without insulin these patients will die 
Now, before insulin was discovered, everyone with type 1 diabetes mellitus would die, well, I don't know, within a few months probably, certainly within a year I would have thought. And indeed, in parts of the world where insulin is not available, this is still a death sentence. These patients will die. But in 1922, two guys called Banting and Best, Charles Best and Frederick Banting, did experiments with, with dogs. One famous dog called Marjorie. And what they did with Marjorie, as I understand, they took a pancreas out. And then they put in, and of course, if you take a pancreas out, she's not going to produce any insulin at all. And she developed acute type 1 diabetes mellitus. And then they introduced pancreatic extract from uh, another dog. And uh, that, that cured the diabetes mellitus, uh, albeit for a short time. And, and indeed, when I was a student, the, the, the insulin that we used was porcine or bovine, pig insulin and uh, cow insulin. But then l later on, we developed uh, human insulins. Now, what happens with human insulins is some clever geneticists actually took the human genes that produce insulin out of human chromosomes and put them in bacteria and now bacteria brew up the insulin for us. It's almost like making alcohol in big, big vats. And all you've got to do is refine it and you've got the human insulin. We, we have to have the bacteria to make it because it's a protein. We're not very good at making proteins. Albeit a small protein, it's only about 50 odd, 51 I think amino acids in insulin. Something like that. And of course that explains why we can't take insulin tablets because if we ate the tablets that the protein would simply be digested in the stomach. So it's got to be given by injection. And these patients are insulin-dependent diabetics. They have IDDM. And all insulin these days is 100 units per mil. So we can give short-acting insulins, actrapid insulins. These peak within two to four hours, so they can be given just before a meal. Uh, the duration of their activity is up to eight hours. There's intermediate and longer-acting insulins. There's different types, isophane, zinc suspensions. The, the onset here is one to four hours and, and they can have some activity for over 24 hours, maybe up to 35 hours, something like that. You might have come across uh, in, insulin gl glargain. This is a clear solution and it precipitates in the subcutaneous compartment and, and absorbs out into the body slowly over about 24 hours. So, you know, insulin regimes need tailored to, to the individual's requirements. You've got to look at how many calories the person needs and then give them enough enough insulin to to balance that out. And then, oh yeah, when, when someone's diagnosed with diabetes, it's actually, because it's autoimmune, there's other conditions that can present with it. So part of the assessment is looking for celiac disease, which of course is a gluten intolerance. They can't tolerate wheat, or gluten from wheat causes really bad diarrhea, they don't absorb it. And thyroid autoimmune diseases, autoimmune diseases can reduce thyroid function, so that's, that's worth checking for. Another diseases which are more common in diabetic, uh, pernicious anemia later on in life, uh, vitiligo where they get white patches, and ev even Addison's disease. Uh, other autoimmune diseases are more common in diabetes and sh should be screened for. Then it's a matter of getting your health education right. We want to avoid hypoglycemic attacks because they can be life-threatening. But there again, we want to keep the uh, glycosylated levels of hemoglobin at reasonably low levels because, of course, it is the chronic hyperglycemia which gives rise to so many of the longer-term complications of diabetes mellitus.